And it is in progress, huzzah, huzzah. A couple of things I wanna highlight, we'll be talking about these also during the, the chat today, but uh, uh, we do have a WhatsApp group that we form for community and allies. So researchers, are, researchers and others are also welcome to join this community chat. You can see the URL there. We will be dropping that in the chat so you can easily access it, but we hope to uh, have you join us in this virtual community uh, throughout the conference. You do not need to be registered for the conference to be part of the WhatsApp group. And for people who are in person coming to CROI, for the first time ever, we have an official community networking zone. So we have some tables that are designated. You'll find us in the poster hall. We plan to be there during the poster sessions in the afternoons on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. But those tables will be available throughout the entire conference for people who want to have meetings, connect, uh, network, et cetera, et cetera. Eat your lunch. Uh, please utilize the community networking zone uh, if you are attending the conference uh, and come by and see us. So Margarita Breakfast Clubs, we've been doing these for the last couple of years. These are virtual uh, sessions that help orient folks around the science that's being presented at CROI. Well, they are backed by popular demand for 2023. We'll be doing three Margarita Breakfast Clubs, um, each on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of the conference, every morning, bright and early, 7 to 8 a.m. But they are on Zoom. We will not have an in-person component for these. So whether you're in Seattle or somewhere else, you can join us from the comfort of your house, your room, in your slippers, what have you. Please join us. Uh, and we'll be sharing some of the hottest science with the leading researchers who are presenting that science at CROI this year. The schedule is being firmed up this week, so stay tuned for that. Um, what else do I want to say about that? I hope you'll join us. Oh, so Jim, know. you. Sorry, you had a really good question. Is it the, is the chat, um, the margarita breakfast at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time or Eastern? Oh, thank you for bringing that up, Jessica. It is Pacific time. So these time, that time is oriented to Pacific because that's where the conference is. So if you're on the East Coast, you don't have to freak out. It's a little bit later for those uh, on the West Coast. Uh, it's early, um, but we're used to that if we're at Croy. Uh, you do not need to be registered to join these Margarita Breakfast Clubs. So again, stay tuned for that. And I wanted to share uh, my playlist. If you were, if you came in and uh, joined early, we always open these webinars about 15 minutes early. There's a playlist. Um, we didn't get to hear the entire thing. Uh, All Cried Out, which is an important uh, uh, song after Croy is over. <laughs> and then, of course, shiny happy people because we all recover. So there's your playlist. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, it's really exciting. It's jam packed. We're going to be meeting the CROI chair and vice chairs of the conference, um, talking to me and my, my colleagues, the CROI community liaisons, including Don and Nintendo. We're going to be shouting out Michael Luella, who is one of our hostesses with the Mostus in uh, Seattle. Uh, we're going to meet uh, and hear from Donna Jacobson, IAS USA's Executive Director. IAS USA uh, is the secretariat that puts on CROI. We'll be hearing from Carlos Del Rio from the Scientific Program Committee. Deidre Grant of AVAC is going to be giving us some tips and tricks for navigating an intense and sometimes overwhelming conference like CROI. And then we're really excited about this component that's coming uh, in, the, in the later part of the webinar for about the last half hour, we're going to uh, have a session on improving our research literacy. Uh, and we have two wonderful presenters who are gonna be guiding us through that. Jessica, Jessica Salzadwell with AVAC and Victoria Sperling Walker with BIDMC. Uh, Victoria is gonna be walking us through um, an oral presentation she actually did last year and helping us orient to the various um, ways data are presented on the slide, kind of get us in the mood and get us ready for, for CROI. So we're really excited about that. And I think this might be the end of my slides. Let me see, yes, now we're just repeating. So let me stop sharing. And I am going to uh, invite Diane and Jim 
and Landon. I'm pretty sure all of you are here. Um, why don't we start off with the chair of the conference, Jim? Would you like to say some? And you're on mute. You're on mute. Okay. Um, so, Jim, thanks. And uh, Diane and Landon will chime in here in just a second. But um, those of you who are new to CROI, there are, there are three components to it it's clinical uh, science, basic science, and epidemiology and public health. So, that, that covers the, the three pillars of CROI that you're going to be hearing about. Uh, and, and we've worked closely uh, with Jim, uh, Dawn, and, and Tondo uh, to make sure that uh, community voices are uh, composing the program. And uh, I think this, this pre-Get Ready CROI is a, is a fabulous way to, to make a very large and sometimes daunting meeting a, a, a bit more approachable to all of you. Um, so there are lots of tools that you're going to be hearing about to be in touch with with what is happening, but we're, Landon and, and Diane can, can, will chime in here in a second, but we are extremely excited about this, this being the first in-person meeting since 2019, so four years. Uh, our opening ceremony uh, will, will make special reference to that um, in, in ways that, that you'll see, but, uh, and it's also Croy's 30th anniversary, so lots to celebrate. Being back together, building on the on the in-person experience as well as uh, including virtual colleagues, which we now can do very well thanks to the the pandemic. But um, but we, I, I think, in addition, one, one thing we are trying we've tried hard to do with this is to really set the tone that there is an ongoing pandemic. There are challenges ahead. We have to work together, so that tone is going to be uh, present throughout. Um, <clears throat> Jim, I, we can we can talk specifically about what are exciting things at Croy, but I, I know that there are some general notes that you wanted us to to hit. Um, so, how would you like us to to talk about our respective areas at Croy, Jim? Sure, good question, Jim. I think you can each sort of share what you're looking forward to from your section. And then any any information you want to share uh, about Croy this year, uh, the new venue, what have you, um, your clock is ticking. Uh, <laughs> so so be concise. But we would yeah. love to hear from each of you, kind of what you're each excited about in terms of content and just coming back together after several years being apart. Right. So the big chair role I'll have is to just build on this excitement of being back together, and I will I will do that. Um, with enthusiasm at the opening uh, session. Uh, things to look for that I'm really excited about. So the the Fields, uh, the Bernard Fields lecture, Alan Pearlson is the person who, who, who really described what it means to have viral loads drop when therapy is started or some sort of an intervention happens. He's a mathematician, but that changed the field for those of you who were uh, involved uh, back, back in the beginning. So Alan, Alan Pearlson's Fields lecture about that is something I'm especially excited about. Jen, there's a lot of talk about, a lot of uh, new science in reservoirs, interventions that have reduced them. Um, some very creative interventions that you're gonna hear about from the Emory group. So, so I think the whole reservoir section, what, how it drops, what are the immune responses that can enable that to happen, all approaching themes of what, what can we do to keep viral loads suppressed or even eliminated when um, when uh, antiretroviral therapy is stopped. Um, uh, the, the Mosaico vaccine trial that you've all heard about, we are gonna hear some data about that from Larry Corey and Susan Bookbinder. So that is a special session at the end of, I think, Tuesday. Um, so after the symposium sessions are completed, that, that is going to be uh, presented. So we're gonna really hear some data about what happened with that trial. Um, what else? Uh, Tony Fauci, um, reflecting on 50 years of service at NIH, will be in the opening session. Uh, I'm excited about that, as are many people. Uh, and uh, so why don't I stop there and turn things over to Diane for oh, clinical? Great. 
<laughs> yes, thank you. Hi, good morning, good evening, everyone. I'm Diane Havler from University of California, San Francisco, and I am the lead for the clinical science um, at the CROI conference. We're so excited about the conference and so excited that all of you in this call will be participating in some format. So let me just tell you what I'm in the plenary session. There is a special lecture called the Angali Man Lecture. And um, uh, Dr. Kevin DeCock will be given this lecture, which will focus on um, doing science with a human rights centered approach. Um, in terms of clinical science, let me just give you a couple of the highlights that I'm looking forward to. We're at a dawn of new era with long acting antiretroviral agents, both for treatment and prevention. We're going to have a terrific plenary. HIV affects people of all ages. We're going to have a terrific plenary on aging with HIV. Um, we also, hepatitis B is another virus that affects many people around the world. And um, there is a really surge in new information about how we can work towards um, uh, a functional cure for hepatitis B. There's gonna be new information on uh, st strategic approaches to TB. We're constantly trying to develop new drugs and shorten um, the time it takes to cure a person with TB, whether it's drug sensitive or drug resistance. We've all um, experienced this MPOX outbreak in 2022, and there's more questions than answers. We're going to have a special session on that and really emphasize that we need to understand how this surge, and we also need to be putting more attention to places where MPOX is still endemic. And we're also still living, as we know, with SARS-CoV-2, and there are there's so much new exciting data about treatments for SARS-CoV-2 um, for people who have mild to moderate disease. So those are some of the highlights from the clinical session. I just wanna say, of course, like a wiki experience, one cannot absorb all the information. So we rely on each other and we share the information throughout and after the conference. So over to you, Landon. Wonderful. Thanks, Diane. Um, and thanks, Jim. And thanks, Jim Pickett, for putting on this session. It, it strikes me that these scientific conferences are here to disseminate the latest information. And one of the, the great ways to do it is through, um, through the engagement of people representing different communities, including the scientific community, but also um, different community advocates. Um, and so thank you all for being here. There's too much exciting stuff going on in at CROI this year. Um, sort of, I, I feel like you could be two or three people moving through the meeting and not see everything. Um, in, I chair the epidemiology and public health section of the meeting. And um, in addition to the Ngali Man lecture that Diane alluded to, we have exciting plenaries on 20 years of PEPFAR, on uh, reproductive rights and how they're under threat, as we all know, particularly for uh, people living with HIV in America right now. And then we have the, the usual selection of the latest science in HIV prevention treatment services from a population perspective, um, data on new data on cabotegravir breakthrough infections, uh, our delivery or failure to deliver effective PrEP services in different populations, um, and the latest interventions around uh, delivering more effective HIV treatment services in different populations, new testing interventions, lots of exciting science. The thing that um, sort of sticks its head out among the, um, as the most exciting for me is our COVID and MPOX programming, which is um, there are going to be new special se sessions in the clinical uh, COVID and MPOX and epidemiology of COVID and MPOX. Um, and these are not going to be things you want to miss because otherwise you'll have sort of FOMO and your friends will all hear about things and you won't hear about them. Um, <laughs> and, and I think it's going to be really, really great programming. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you all at the meeting. Um, thank you for joining today. And uh, Jim Pickett, I'm a little bit jealous that we don't have this kind of guide to to Croy for scientists, because I wish I had someone to tell me where to go as well. So over to you, Jim Pickett. Yeah, we all need someone to tell us where to go for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Landon, uh, Diane, and Jim so much for joining us and welcoming us. I now would like to bring forward my colleagues in the Community Liaison Subcommittee, um, Don Averitz, and let me... Uh, Put a spotlight on you, Don, and Intando. Let's see, where are you, Intando? Hey oh, there. You found me. <laughs> I found you both. Yay. <laughs> um, so why don't you each introduce yourselves 
Uh, and uh, oops, I just got rid of Don. Sorry about that. I'm going to put you back, Don. Why don't you start in Tondo since I'm messing around with these spotlights? Um, no, tell absolutely. us who you are and give us a little, a uh, little bit of information from the CLS perspective. No, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I think first of all, my name is Dan Doyola. I am with the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation in Cape Town, as well as an advocacy organization known as Advocates for Prevention of HIV in Africa. And uh, I mean, you know, looking at Jim and listening to them, Jim, Diane in London, um, and seeing the excitement in the science. And I think this is really the, the amount of science and even more as communities and advocates that we are looking to really um, have, especially for those who will be able to make it in person at Croy. But I think most importantly, and I know that uh, Don agrees with this, I'd really like to give a shout out to you, Jim, for all your leadership. And I mean, coming into this webinar and all of the fancy things, it just made me, you know, feel like I'm in some, you know, show on Broadway uh, <laughs> about to see <laughs> something very exciting. And I think the innovation and the excitement that you you inject into Zoom meetings, I think is really exciting. But most importantly, how you just, you know, bringing a lot of excitement. And of course, with we, we, you know, we're happy with Don to be working alongside your leadership in doing all of this. Well, I think again, in well, I'll leave the other exciting part because we've heard about all the lectures done and I'll leave the, another important lecture that, uh, um, that you are going to share about that will be happening during opening plenary. But I see, I see Croy, um, like, uh, of course, many other conferences in our work as the field uh, of um, HIV um, uh, uh, research and, and related um, uh, health issues as a springboard of our advocacy and community engagement work, because I think it really sets us uh, off to really hear about all the science and the implications of the science of all of the things that we are personally passionate about in our individual networks, organizations, and at times uh, as individuals personally. So I think CROI really becomes that exciting uh, show uh, where you, I think as we heard from London that, you know, there's so much to choose from. And so, you know, everywhere, I mean, uh, many things to look into and follow as part of what each of us is interested in. So, so I think as a springboard, it really sets us off to be able, as we go back, uh, to, to really look at all the evidence that science has shared so that we are able to either uh, look into it, critique, to uh, mobilize as in, you know, for communities to all to understand what this work is about, but most importantly, really advocate both in science and the outcomes of science and what they mean for our country and many other things that are really happening structurally. So this is really why CROI is exciting and excited for all of us who will be meeting. But I think it's really great that even if you won't be there in person, there are means um, with all partners that are working with us as well as to make CROI accessible to all, you know, to all of us and uh, the break, breakfast margarita sessions and, and with, you know, with all of the partners across the different regions, which is important to highlight uh, because we really want as many as possible to be there and get to understand and at least get a glimpse of what is happening. So we're really excited, looking forward, we're going to be having um, the, the networking zone as a, as, as Jim has said, and please we really encourage all of us to network, network with scientists, network amongst each other as communities, and we look forward into the into next week um, as, our, as we're all getting ready. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nintendo. <laughs> Over to you, Don. Well, I think Nintendo said it all pretty much. And uh, so I, I deeply appreciate that, but I want to echo his appreciation for Jim. Uh, Jim, for your leadership and uh, going the extra mile. All of this is uh, is the extra mile. So we really appreciate it. Um, I am very excited about being together in person again. I think the opportunities to network and to talk and to digest um, the things that you hear on the stage and, and from the big screen are um, 
just essential. And uh, the Margarita Breakfast Clubs really are a great opportunity for us to share to those who can't be in the room um, and to, and also for those who are in the room to really, um, you know, have another venue to, to really work it out and, and, um, and make sure that we're taking home the key uh, critical points and messages. Um, I think the opening, as, as, um, as has already been said, the 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 opening session is going to be extraordinary, and um, and I think I can't tell you how excited I am about Yvette Ralph doing our Martin Delaney talk. Um, I think that is going to be um, pretty extraordinary. Uh, the fact that over the last couple of years, the role of the community has been elevated to the opening session in the Martin Delaney presentation is something that I think speaks volumes. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what she has to say and um, setting the stage for the conversations that happen throughout the course of the meeting. Um, I, I won't uh, belabor the points that uh, Tondo made already. Um, but just to say that um, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in Seattle who can make it, and if not, seeing the rest of you on the Margarita Breakfast Club conversations as we figure out how to share the science and all of the important conversations that are happening at CROI with our communities around the world. So uh, back to you, Jim, or even to our hostess, Michael. Thank you, Don. Yes, uh, Michael, give me one second. I want to share one more little tidbit with everybody. Um, this year, uh, CROI has, is supporting 22 community educator scholars. So what the CLS does, Don and Tando and I, we review scholarship applications for this category, community educators, every year. Mm -hmm. This year, we were able to bring 22 folks uh, to Seattle. Most folks are coming to Seattle. I think there may be a few who are virtual now. Um, but we're super excited about this group. Uh, of the 22, um, we're representing 16 different countries. So it is quite a diverse array. It is quite a young array. And 16 of those uh, 22 people have never been to Croy. So wow. we're super excited to be bringing in um, some fresh blood, some fresh eyeballs, some fresh energy. And we really look forward uh, to the community educators um, meeting you all. If you're on the webinar right now, please do a little, say something in the chat, let us know you're here. But we hope to see you uh, at CROI and if, during the Margarita Breakfast Clubs, on the WhatsApp group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I wanted to give um, our hostess with the mostess, um, Mr. and Ms. Seattle, um, mm -hmm. Michael Luella, um, I don't know if you're more Nirvana or more of the Perry Como Seattle. You can tell us which one you you relate to more, Michael. But Michael is going to be kind of helping us uh, in the community networking zone and other places, being our go-to Seattle host. So, Michael, uh -huh. uh, what do you want to tell us? Uh, bring layers of clothing to wear layers because you don't know what it'll actually be like. So it could be actually chilly. It could be nicer than we expect. So just always have a layer. You know, think about that, and that's how you can stay uh, appropriately dressed. That's my only advice I have, except uh, if you have any questions while you're there, I'll try to be at the community networking zone all the time. So please uh, don't hesitate to ask me anything that you want to know about um, uh, in terms of what is available to you in downtown Seattle and our neighborhoods around it. So let me know. I'll help you. And Michael, you still need to answer the question. Are you uh, Nirvana Seattle or Perry Como Seattle or some other version of Seattle? Well, I was going to say I'm more Nirvana Seattle just simply <laughs> because that's my age bracket. Uh, Perry Como was before me, but I would say in terms of the humor that I find in Perry Como, I'm a 50-50. Um, I just always laughed at whenever you hear that the bluest skies I've ever seen were in Seattle. I'm like, well, that's a surprise to me. <laughs> Clearly, Perry was had never been to Seattle before. And I, I, when I heard that song, too, I thought that has to be on the playlist. That is too perfect for this conference. So thank you, Michael, so much. Thank you, Diane, um, Donna, I mean, Dawn and Intando, all these D words. Um, speaking of D-words, we're going to now, I'm going to now invite Donna Jacobson from IES USA, the folks who put on this crazy conference every year, um, and now, now doing it in person at a brand new venue in Seattle. I'm going to bring her forward and um, tell us what's going on, Donna. 
Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's my real pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And um, thank you to Jim, Don, and Antando, and particularly for Jim for leading this effort with the CLS. Just like with the program committee, the scientific program committee, um, Jim, Nantando, and Dawn are all volunteers and spend a tremendous amount of time really trying to make sure CROI serves the community and that they represent CROI to the community. And it is a huge lift and we really appreciate it, particularly Jim, for everything you're doing to put on, on, on all these different activities and keeping you know, your agenda at the forefront. So thank you to everybody and thank you everybody for being here. Okay, so I'm gonna be the nerdy one in the group because I have some slides because I know there are some graphics that people are interested in seeing. Uh, so if I could, hold on, share my screen. I will show you, all right, Koi 2023. Can you all see my slide? They look great, Donna. Okay, Croy 2023 at TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. Opening session is <laughs> one week from yesterday. And as uh, everybody has said, we are so excited about it. Um, come on, slide, next slide. There we go, back in Seattle. Um, this has been a long time coming. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about the venue. Everybody who's been to Croy before, do not go to the arch where we've always gone in the past. It's about three blocks away. It's closer to the Hyatt Regency and the Paramount and the Mayflower Hotel. Um, I will tell you that up until three weeks ago, we weren't sure this new convention center would actually be open. When we signed the contract with Seattle. It was supposed to be open in August. And that as uh, the chairs and, and Jim and Dawn and Natando know, we were on pins and needles up until three weeks ago, figuring out what's plan B and God, please don't let pan, plan B be virtual again, right? But three weeks ago, they announced that the convention center is open. It's gorgeous, it's airy, it's roomy. There'll be tons of places to just do informal sit downs and networking. Um, apart from the formalized networking area that we have in the poster hall, which is pretty much in between the um, where we have the simultaneous overflow. So if you're in the poster hall, you want to listen to a session that's going on, grab a mic, grab a headset, put it on, and you can dial into whatever session you want. Um, also juxtaposed to the food. Um, so that will be in the convention center. So who is going to be at Croy? Um, we expect 3,500 attendees about, give or take. We're still taking in some virtual attendees. And right now there are people, as we expected, converting from in-person to virtual. But we have about 3,000 people who were coming in person. That's way over what we expected. We guessed at 1,500, maybe 2,000. Um, so here is a point of an apology and gratitude to everyone. And I know that some of the community educator scholarship awardees have been incredibly patient um, because as some of you know, um, CROI 2020 in flipping to virtual, um, CROI got subject to a number of penalties for the cancellation. And I'm not gonna go into great detail, but I will say it was two agonizing, excruciating years of litigation over the cancellation. As Jim Hoxie said at one of the points in litigation, what the heck would, have you, would you people have done with what we knew about COVID, right? So that we could not put ourselves at financial risk about that again. So we guaranteed low, particularly on the hotels. And I'm saying this because I want to, again, express the people who have been waiting for hotel reservations as we move through, through things. You all who've been um, part of the scholarship program before, you know Jose and Karen, and um, Jose especially, who manages the scholarship program, have tried so hard this year to make something, a process available to the scholarship recipients that ensured they were in hotels that are close to the convention center, had the amenities that we need needed, and reserved those rooms for them. As all good intentions will go, things fell, fell down in the technology end. So it didn't go as well as they expected, but I think Everything is uh, taken care of now. And again, I thank everybody for their patience. I think I thank Jim for being the concierge and liaison among all of that. Um, but um, I, I, I did want to 
um, extend. Also, if anybody has any problems, please come to Jose, me, Karen, anybody up on the fourth floor at the ISUSA office, because we do expect glitches. This is, uh, has been an, uh, a, an unusual birthing of a, of a program. So um, in terms of our attendees, about 60% is going up and down a percentage or two from the US and 40%, just like we expected in, in the olden days, the pre-pandemic days, 40% come from around the world. Okay, scientific program. Um, Jim put this in the note about um, this morning about the reminder. On Friday, everybody got a link to the uh, pr preliminary agenda. That's the program at a glance. That is updated regularly. So when you can go to the program on the website, make sure you do the refresh button. Um, there are errors, there are omissions, and there are last minute changes to the program that we're gonna post in the electronic version. Um, we've got wonderful plenary sessions, symposia, theme discussions are back, and we've got special sessions at Jim, as Jim mentioned. So in terms of the original research, uh, 1,005 original research abstracts. Croy is back in full. Um, 115 oral abstracts and 834 poster abstracts. Of those, as Jim mentioned, there are 228 cutting edge SARS-CoV-2 COVID. Um, we pushed that deadline for SARS-CoV-2 and MPOX to the very latest we could to make sure everything is cutting edge and to the minute. So there's 228 eight SARS-CoV-2 and 61 original uh, MPOX abstracts that you'll see data presented at CROI. Um, okay, when you, for those of you coming in person, CROI is a mass required conference. We will not be the super spreader. And if we're being overly cautious, thank goodness to us, right? We wanna make sure everyone at CROI is safe. We're gonna ask everybody to wear your mask appropriately. Um, Vaccination verification, you should have gotten the link on Friday. Another link is going out today that just has more clearly your username and your uh, access to get into the crowd pass CROI vaccination. Obviously in person only, virtual folks <laughs> don't need to do the vaccination. There are questions that we're just getting now about what is uh, verification. Are we following WHO or are we following CDC? We have a chair call today uh, in about 15 minutes. We're going to go over as much as we can in terms of questions. And of course, before you leave for CROI, if you are experience COVID symptoms, test, if you test positive, stay home. Or if you're at CROI and you test positive, go back to your hotel room or wherever where you can isolate. Please help us keep everyone safe. Um, I know this is what everybody wants to know about the conference platform. So I will tell you that even the chairs have not seen the first draft of the program. Did I say that we're less than a week from opening CROI? <laughs> I would say this year, the platform is like a gigantic app with a little more features. Um, it doesn't serve you coffee in your slippers and doesn't do all those fancy things that, you know, walk into a lobby and all that. It really, the basic functions of the platform are to stream out for those of you who are virtual or those of you who are reading from your room, to stream out the, uh, the sessions, you can view all of the abstracts, all the electronic posters that have been submitted, and you can chat and you can live stream questions. A note about questions this year. Um, we are not expecting to people for people in person to get up to a microphone, spit all over it, and then hand it to the next person. All, all microphones of questions this year are gonna come through the platform. If you're there in person, make sure you get on the platform or the Slido app. We'll give you instructions when you get there to submit questions that will all be sent into the moderators. We learned in virtual Croys that the Q&A session works so much better if the chairs have a chance to consolidate questions. You know, hundreds come in and we have 10 minutes to answer maybe 10 of them, right? So not everybody's questions get answered, but the spirit of them, we hope, are consolidated into that one Q and A session. All right, this is where you're gonna what you're gonna get as the link to the platform, and you're gonna sign in using your information. If you sign in as virtual, you get a little bit of a different link than if you signed in as an in person. But you're in person, you're in the room. You can go on the platform. You can go to your up to your room. You can go to the restroom and you know keep in touch with what the live sessions going going on are. 
And this is the big reveal. This is what the platform looks like. We're going for ease of access and simplicity. So we're hoping these buttons, rather than a picture of a lobby with different rooms you go into, this is where you're gonna get your live sessions, the program guide, which will be updated. There will be notifications every day, which, which uh, programs have changed, if there's accessible information. You can search by keywords and by authors. Um, and then always to go back to here for the home. And then again, as as as, as Jim had mentioned and others, um, the, the CLS have worked so hard to make sure there are accessible ways like this webinar, like the webinars before this, um, the Margarita Breakfast Club's going through the data in the morning, and then the, the networking area that Michael will, says he'll be there 24-7 till they kick him out and say poster halls closed. Um, so that being said, well, on, my, on behalf of the ISUSA and my team, some of whom are here today, Kevin, Karen, Jose, um, Jay, everybody who you'll see at CROI, we're here for you. Um, please come and see us on the fourth floor if you have any questions or issues. And, and thank you again to Jim and the CLS for hosting this. Thank you so much, Donna. I uh, appreciate uh, you sharing all that information and being with us here today in this really incredibly busy time. Um, I would now like to uh, hand the floor over briefly to our friend, Dr. Carlos Del Rio, um, who is a member of the Scientific Program Committee. Carlos. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, uh, first of all, I want to welcome everybody. I want to thank uh, Jim and the organizers for this. I think this is a wonderful way to to introduce people to CROI, which is very confusing. And my role is to talk a little bit about posters. And posters are indeed very confusing. A lot of information, a lot of the science gets presented in posters. And at least my express my impression over the years has been that posters are really overwhelming. There's so much to see. You don't know where to go. So I think it's good to have a technique. Posters are organized by science tracks, by areas of interest. So usually what I do the day before posters go up, I like to go over the posters, I like to go over the abstracts, and I like to highlight, even if you can do it even before, highlight the ones I wanna go see, highlight the ones I'm really interested in, and then really make a point to go there. There are certain days that the authors of the posters are actually supposed to stand by their posters, and that's a good opportunity to go talk to them, to go, uh, get, a, get a, a, a personal sort of one-on-one -on -one or one on several other people about what the poster is about. This year, we're also gonna be doing something called a poster walks. And poster walks is a member of the Science Scientific Program Committee is gonna select a series of posters and he's just gonna walk and talk about them. And it's gonna be a little bit like doing rounds, you know, what we do in the hospital or going around seeing the patients. Well, instead of seeing patients and talking about the patients, we're gonna be seeing posters and talking about the science. So a good opportunity to join those poster rounds and, and walk poster walks and to hear what, what people have to say. And there's, there, there's great conversations that happen during that time. Uh, over, Jim. Oh, awesome, Carlos. Thank you so much. I was like, I don't know. I was just expecting you to continue. It was so um, uh, excited. I, I, I'm thankful for you uh, uh, kind of helping demystify or make the posters a little more feeling accessible to people. And I think these poster walks are a really great idea. Um, you know, Croy as a whole can be really overwhelming and um, the poster hall itself can be just kind of take you down. So I think going well, on the these, thing, the going thing, on these the walks thing, is a great idea. Go ahead. The other thing, Jim, the other thing, Jim with posters is even if you don't get to see a poster, it later on, all of the posters are up in the website and you can eventually go see them. So you said, oh, I missed this poster. Well, you know, if you identify which one you go want to go see, you can go and find it afterwards because the images of the posters will be all in the website. Awesome. Thank hey, you. Buddy, Thank talk, you. Talk to the poster authors. They want to hear from you. I, I find it's awfully intimidating to go up to a poster and ask somebody question about their work but they love it they really want to oh hear it. they they really do people want to talk about their work people are excited about it people want to answer questions about their work it's really cool uh agree 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 and as someone and we've all a lot of us have presented posters and there's nothing sadder than standing by your poster and never no one coming by to say hi or talk to you or show any interest 
Um, so uh, this is definitely also about supporting each other in the work. Um, so please don't let anyone just stand there by themselves looking sad, go over and uh, ask a question. Um, they'll be delighted to talk to you. So now I am going to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Deidre Grant, who um, uh, has been a veteran of many of these conferences and is going to share um, some tips and tricks for navigating this conference. And I'm going to be sharing slides for you, Dee, correct? Yes, thank you, Jim. So let me and welcome everyone. Get my act together. Perfect. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. And thank you, Jim, for having me. And also really thrilled to see the community educator scholars um, who popped in the chat and welcome, particularly those first timers. Um, spending the next few minutes, you'll hear some echoes of some of the presentations we've had um, earlier in the webinar, but really wanted to give a chance to speak specifically to the community educators and any folks who are newer to CROI and, and sharing for those of us who've, who've been a number of times and really sharing those tips and tricks for how to get the most out of it. Because as Intando and others have said, it's really a tremendous opportunity um, for learning and networking and connecting from community and researchers. Um, and would also really love to see there's a bunch of amazing um, resources, resource people on this call. Um, so particularly for those of you who are going to be in person in Seattle, I would welcome you to pop that information in the chat or, you know, as I go through the next couple of slides, if, if things come to mind for your own personal tips and tricks as you prepare for these really in-depth meetings um, to, to share those with the group. Um, so again, just reiterating, Croy, we've talked about it's a great opportunity to learn and connect. Um, there's tons of science in all different formats and plenaries, oral abstract sessions, the symposia. We just heard about the posters, and I'm super excited to hear about the poster walks, um, which I think will be a really tremendous opportunity, particularly for community educators. And then, as I think we've referenced before, it's really a rich resources, resource that you can tap throughout the year, um, given that everything is recorded and available on the site. Um, so Jim is going to the next slide. Wanted to talk a little bit about how, like, ideas for how to get the most out of it. So a big piece that we'll we'll spend a minute on is having real realistic expectations and really taking care of yourself. It's a number of you know long science information packed days. I think particularly given that it'll be the first in person in a while, um, folks will also be really excited to be in person. So. So take, take care of yourselves, recognizing that, that it's been a while um, for many of us. And we'll have a couple of slides on this idea of creating your own track. So it can be a way to make a lot of science a little bit more accessible, depending on, on the focus of your work or, or the community you're representing um, at the conference. And then I think in the same way um, that Carlos recommended, reviewing the, the poster list, I find it really essential and has been super helpful for me ahead of time and looking in depth at the, the program guide and looking at the different sessions and, and really making, making my schedule ahead of time um, because there's so much interesting stuff there um, that it helps to, helps to orient and really understanding that there are a lot of different kinds of presentations. So, you know, the plenaries in the morning, the symposia are, are nice sort of synthesis sessions, similarly on the theme discussions. Oral abstracts are very specific to, you know, sort of a 10 minute presentation on new data. Um, so they're really, you can sort of pick and choose and make a, a diverse and dynamic schedule for yourself. So really recommend that. And then just as soon as the, the online uh, portal is available, that is something that is worth checking out ahead of time. So you're sort of comfortable in the space um, before the, the session starts. Um, so again, in the creating your own track, think about what are you, what interests you, what do you want to get from CROI, what matters to the communities that you serve or your particular area of focus. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I scanned through um, the program guide and pulled out a few, and this is 
what the program guide looks like. Don't be intimidated. It's still, you know, easy to scroll through um, and you can get a sense of, you know, organized by the plenaries and the symposia at the start um, and then more information on the abstract sessions. But even when you're looking to like the section on the far right side, which has a number of oral abstracts, even there are times when you might pick one or two in a session and you could go back and forth um, depending on, you know, what particular like granular information, but really recommend. So I work at AVAC. Um, a lot of our focus is on HIV prevention, research and implementation. So I highlighted here a number of the sessions that, you know, I would keep my eye on. Um, but at the same time would recommend having, you know, at least one or two sort of outside of your regular comfort zone, um, because you never know what you might uncover or come across. Um, so on the next couple of slides, we'll talk about, again, reiterating that one of the ways, or there are a number of ways to really make sure you get the most out of the week while also taking care of yourself. Um, so again, being ready and willing to ask questions. Um, and I guess in with, when you're in person, it'll be on the app, which I think will be great. I know it can be really intimidating for folks to get up in front of a, a microphone in front of a large crowd. Um, so really excited to see the, the opportunity for everyone to feed in via the app. Um, as Jim's already discussed, the WhatsApp group, um, and certainly at the, the Margarita Breakfast Club web webinars, is going to be a great chance. You know, there's no stupid question. I'm really lean on folks because um, it's a really wonderful community um, that I've experienced in my years of attending CROI. So really, you know, put the questions out there um, again on the WhatsApp and the webinars. And then it's so wonderful to see that there will be the advocates sort of community networking zone in the poster hall. Um, so really encourage folks to head there. And then on the next slide, again, take care of yourself. It's, there's a ton of weedy science um, and especially when you're going to new, new areas of interest, lean on your colleagues, use the WhatsApp group, pace yourself, particularly if you are you know, sitting in front of your screen and joining virtually, take some time away from the screen, um, you know, get fresh air. It sounds like a beautiful new conference center, um, but also, you know, giving your, your mind a little rest um, is gonna be really important to make sure that you can absorb um, or be in it for the week or in it for the multiple days. Um, and then also, you know, if you do miss a session, you can revisit all of them. They are all going to be recorded um and available within webcasts very quickly so again a wonderful resource that croy makes for everyone and gives folks a, a chance to if you need to reconnect later um, and again just a reminder of all the ways to stay connected the breakfast clubs the whatsapp group uh, social media is a great is a great space um, avac will be doing its usual tweeting um, and a number of folks are pretty prolific tweeters from the conference. AIDS Map and others will be covering the news. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then I think the last slide is just a reminder. Again, this you can see examples from previous CROIs of how dynamic and helpful the WhatsApp group is for sharing spaces um, and information and all that good stuff. So that those are my tips and tricks. And those are some great tips and tricks, Dee. Thank you so much for sharing them. Um, and all the self-care stuff, uh, you know, it, it's so, it's important for every conference, but this conference feels, can feel especially overwhelming and um, overpowering in so many ways. It's so heavy. Uh, so um, take time for yourself. And I think so important to remember, you don't need to go and see everything and do everything. Um, everything will still be there online later. So don't beat yourself up if you just need to take a break during an afternoon session um, or just can't make it to that poster walk you really wanted to. Um, you're gonna do the best you can. So, um, and I think that's, that's I'm saying that for me as well because I can get a little bit, uh, I can be, you know, a little harsh with myself when I think about that. So, so thank you, Dee. Um, and now, um, for the, for the cream on the cake, for the frosting on um, the Sunday, whatever, doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Makes no <laughs> sense. 
<laughs> That's okay, because um, I'm not going to be talking anymore, but I want to turn this over now to uh, my colleague, Jessica Salzadwell from AVAC and Victoria Sperling Walker from BIDMC, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. I think I got it right, but if I said yeah, it wrong, please, please fix it. It's a long acronym. Um, I'm really, I am so excited for you both to be here and um, one of the we've been talking about Croy is overwhelming. It's overwhelming, and it's not just the amount and kind of the sheer volume of data, but it's actually you know each ten minute abstract session, and and sometimes those slides can look like a language you've never seen before, and images you have no idea how to orient yourself around. So really excited that you're going to be helping us kind of break through, break down some of these things, and and help us uh, 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 get our minds ready to, to rumble with Croy. So without further ado, I'm gonna uh, stop talking. I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica and Victoria. Great. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jim. Um, so we're gonna dive right in. So this is, yeah, Victoria walker Sperling. She's the postdoctoral fellow at the, um, Dan Bruce Lab in the Center for Virology and Vaccine Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School in Boston. Um, and she presented last year at CROI 2022 virtually. And so what we're gonna do is Victoria is gonna go through that presentation in the oral abstract, just like she presented it last year. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna go through it again, where she's actually gonna break it down so that we can understand it. And then we're gonna open up the floor for questions. So we encourage you to put it into the chat as it goes through. And I will um, be able to in that second and third round actually go through and we'll ask questions in real time. So Victoria, I'm going to hand it over to okay. you. All righty, let me pull up my PowerPoint. Okay, so um, as Jessica mentioned, I'm first going to go through my oral abstract from last year um, as I presented it then <laughs> um, and then, you know, try to explain it uh, to a you know to you guys as a community of lay people so this particular uh, abstract was about the therapeutic efficacy of combined and active passive immunization in our suppressed shiv infected rhesus macaques so the study i'm discussing today is based on two previous cure studies from our lab the first examined art suppressed uh, uh, sorry, SIV positive rhesus macaques given ad 26 MVA vaccination and a TLR7 agonist. We found that following art discontinuation, all animals had viral rebound, but three out of nine animals in the ad 26 MVA group exhibited post rebound virologic control. The second study looked at a treatment regimen of TLR7 agonist vesotolimod and broadly neutralizing antibody PGT-121 in art suppressed shiv infected rhesus macaques. We found that treatment with both induced both a lower likelihood of rebound and longer time to rebound than vesitolimod or PGT-121 alone. Given the success of the two combinations separately, in this study, our primary objective was to determine if treating art suppressed shiv infected macaques with vesitolimod and both ad 26 MVA vaccination and PGT-121 treatment would result in a higher likelihood of undetectable viral loads at the completion of the study than either previously examined combination alone. Here, we infected 51 rhesus macaques interrectally with SHIV SF162P3, and starting day nine post-infection, treated them with daily ART. The animals were divided into four groups, SHAM, PGT-121 and Vesitolimod, AD26 MVA and Vesitolimod, and AD26 MVA, PGT-121 and Vesitolimod. Vaccination occurred 24, 36, 48, and 60 weeks post-infection. Vesitolimod was administered once every two weeks from weeks 50 to 55, 58 and 64 to 72 for a total of 10 doses. And PGT-121 was given once every two weeks from week 64 to 72 for a total of five doses. All of the animals remained fu fully suppressed during ART with no blips 
despite induction of immune responses from vaccination and vesitolimod induced activation of CD4 T cells. As expected from previous studies, vesitolimod also induced significant activation of CD8 T cells and NK cells and increased expression of several serum cytokines. The magnitude of cell-associated inter interferon gamma responses was significantly increased from both the pre-vaccination time point week 24 post-infection in response to vaccination in both groups given the intervention from week 28 onwards. In contrast, both the sham and the PGT-121 vesitolimod only groups had a small but significant waning in the magnitude of their responses. The breadth of the interferon gamma responses also significantly increased in the vaccinated animals as the number of combined OMF, pol, gag, subpool responses was significantly larger than that at the sham at weeks 28, 40, and 50 post-infection. Together, these data indicate that the AD26 MVA vaccination successfully improved the shiv specific immune responses. Upon treatment interruption, all 15 of the sham animals displayed viral rebound and none developed virologic control by day 168 post-interruption. In line with our previous studies, four out of 12 animals in the PGT-121 and vesitolimod treatment group did not rebound. One animal later displayed control post-rebound. In the AD26 MVA group, all the animals rebounded, but as in our previous study, one third of the animals then showed post-rebound virologic control. Finally, in the combination group, four out of 10 animals did not rebound and an additional three animals displayed post-rebound virologic control for a total of seven out of 10 animals having undetectable viral loads by the conclusion of the study. As expected, all treatment intervention combinations significantly reduced the set point viral load compared to sham treatment. While there was no significant difference between the triple treatment group and either of the dual treatment groups, the triple treatment group tended, trended towards the lowest median viral set point viral load. In line with our previous data, PGT-121 and vesitolimod treatment resulted in both a lowered likelihood of and longer time to viral rebound. Furthermore, there was no significant association of virologic control or time to rebound with pretreatment peak viral loads, suggesting that the treatments were indeed responsible for the improved outcomes. The larger breadth and greater magnitude of cellular interferon gamma responses also correlated with the set point viral load post rebound. This was observed with OMF, pole, and GAG together, as well as individually, with OMF having the strongest and most significant correlations of the three individually further supporting the association of the treatment interventions with lower viral loads. In conclusion, the combination of vesitolimod, AD26 MVA vaccination, and PGT-121 administration resulted in 70% of the animals exhibiting virologic control, only slightly below the summed frequencies of virologic control in the AD26 MVA vaccination and vesitolimod and the PGT-121 and vesitolimod groups. These results suggest that combining passive and active immunization with vesitolimod results in a higher frequency of improved outcomes than either in the presence of vesitolimod alone. I'd like to thank Dr. Dan Baruch in the Baruch Lab at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and all our collaborators at BioQual, the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Gilead Sciences, the Walter Reed uh, Army Institute of Research, and Janssen Vaccines and Prevention. Thank you very much for your attention. So... <laughs> That's how a normal, a normal, um, you know, scientific abstract reading would typically go. Um, and, you know, for lay audiences, you need to think about several key questions um, when reviewing this sort of research, which in this case was looking at boosting immune function using um, therapeutic interventions during art. So for this particular study, uh, one key question is, what are the products that are under investigation? Here it was uh, the TLR7 agonist vesitolimod, which is the, um, oh gosh, uh, uh, the trade name, I think, for it. And then what are the, uh, the and then the AD26 and MVA, which stands for Modified Vaccinia Ankara Virus. Um, and those are two particular uh, viral vectors that are used to 
uh, express HIV proteins without actually having HIV involved. And that vaccination is to induce memory immune responses. And finally, the antibody, the broadly neutralizing antibody, uh, PGT-121, which targets the V3 loop, if I remember correctly, of the envelope protein on the surface of uh, HIV. So another question is, what are the tests that are used to evaluate the effectiveness of these products? Uh, I'm going to go into that as I go back over um, the presentation, uh, but you'll, you'll see. <laughs> um, and then if it's an NHP study, so a non-human primate study, which this is, we're using uh, rhesus macaques. Um, other important questions are what virus is being used, in this case, uh, SHIV-162P3, which stands for the simian human immunodeficiency virus. It's a, um, a fusion of the macaque uh, SIV and a human envelope. And uh, SF162P3 indicates which particular HIV envelope is put into the SIV in particular. And then another question is when did the animal start treatment, whether it was early during, you know, very early acute infection, just during acute infection or during chronic infection. And that matters because we're looking at a different size of the latent reservoir. Um, and the earlier it's usually, the earlier art is initiated, it's usually the easy, well, easier it is to induce some sort of virologic control or uh, lack of rebound using these sorts of treatment interventions. And then finally, a very important question is, how many animals are used in the study? So with monkey studies, uh, monkeys are actually incredibly expensive. <laughs> um, if I remember correctly, for, for each monkey, it costs, I think, about uh, $50,000 to keep them per year. So, um, you know, having, for instance, like 10, 10 to 15 monkeys per group is, is very uh, good. Although in order, typically, sometimes people also do uh, uh, statistics prior to initiating these particular, um, these particular studies in order to make sure that there would be enough animals within the study to make sure that you could actually draw a conclusion. Because if you don't have enough, then it, it starts to get a little uh, fuzzy in terms of how uh, reliable the statistics are. So starting over, uh, usually whenever you have one of these presentations, you have a, a title slide, very important, tells you what the title of the, uh, <laughs> of the uh, presentation is, who's giving it, where they're uh, working, and also typically at CROI, whether or not there's a financial relationship uh, of the author with any particular companies that needs to be disclosed for ethics reasons. Then you have a background slide. Um, so my and for my particular presentation here, what I'm showing you are two of our previous studies. The first one was just looking at the vac looking at vaccination, um, which here, you know, uh, we're looking at viral load graphs. Um, uh, which has the viral load on the y-axis and the days following art discontinuation on the x-axis here. And we're showing what happens specifically when the animals are taken off of art. And the sham animals are animals that we, you know, infected, gave art, and then instead of giving them any intervention, we gave them just say the vehicle, you know, like, um, like, you know, uh, saline. We gave saline instead of say the TLR7 agonist or whatever the, the TLR7 agonist was in. I wasn't involved in that study specifically, so I can't tell you exactly what it would be, but that's what, that's what a sham group is. Um, and then the TLR7 agonist here wasn't uh, the one that we ended up using later. 
Um, but just to explain also what a TLR7 agonist is, because I know, you know, it's not really obvious. Um, it's TLR7 is a marker on cells that sort of works as an alarm uh, to the in to the immune system that there is something odd going on. And TLR7 specifically looks at single-stranded RNA. And that, for instance, is what the genome of HIV is made out of. So this particular alarm bell um, could be war warn cells that there are certain kinds of viruses about. It's just a general pattern recognition receptor. It's not specific. Um, and the vaccination, again, is what we use to actually induce a specific memory immune response. So that's how you can interpret overall what's going on in this portion of this slide. Um, on the right, this is another important kind of graph. So this is the second study that um, my study was based on, and we were treating animals um, who were infected very early and uh, who were infected and then treated very early with ART with a TLR7 agonist. Uh, this time, this was Um it, it was done, as you can see down here, uh, a couple of years later than the first study and the broadly neutralizing antibody PGT-121. And this is a survival, it's called a survival curve or survival graph. Um, here on the y-axis, we're looking at the percent rebound and the sham rebounds very early, which is what we expect because we expect that all of the animals are going to have the virus come back fairly quickly after stopping art. Um, whereas in contrast, the PGT-121 and TLR7 agonist group had the animals who did rebound, rebound later, uh, and not all of them actually rebounded by the end of the study. So that's a general uh, idea of how you can read these two kinds of graphs. So I just and, also want to give us a time check, Victoria, just oh. to say that, yeah. So, but also, Sorry. right, yeah, no, no, just to say too, right, that the placebo is at the top and then the intervention, the combo is at the bottom. That's yeah. The important yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I don't have my <laughs> timer up there. So um, another, the next sort of slide you typically see, and it's occasionally just said out loud or combined with the background slide is a hypothesis statement. So here from science words um, to, to be, you know, casual about it um, to more, a more understandable interpretation. The hypothesis of this study is that we're giving a group of monkeys three treatments that work together um, in the past, and we're hoping that it'll work better, that together the three treatments would work better than uh, just two of each, okay? And from here, uh, because this is a macaque study and it's complicated, uh, this is just a uh, an image of how the study was designed. Um, and for instance, you know, the first study I mentioned, the one that had the vaccination with the AD26 and MVA vector and the TLR7 agonist, the difference between that study and this one is that we also added the broadly neutralizing antibody. So that's sort of what's going on with this particular slide. Also uh, important is here, I have N equals a number that indicates the number of animals that were in each group. Um, although I don't have it written here, two of the animals in group one um, had to be euthanized for non, um, for reasons not related to the study itself, but those are the sorts of things you'd see in this sort of study design slide. So here, the reason that this slide is here is to show that despite the fact that, you know, we did all these interventions while the animals were on art, um, all of the monkeys actually had negative viral loads during their treatments. And that's important to show that, you know, all of the different animal groups sort of look the same um, because we don't, <laughs> because there, there might be, say, um, 
differences were we to see viral blips um, during the later part of the art uh, treatment and the the interventions if they were different from sham. So that's something that we'd want we'd be concerned about if we didn't see this sort of thing. Here, this is I know a very very complicated slide, um, but the the bottom line is that the vaccine caused good immune responses. So what we're looking at here are the results of an assay called the Ellis spot, where we take cells and um, from the animals and through, I think it's through like a dye and antibody system, we're able to see whether or not there are adaptive, so memory immune responses to particular small chunks of protein. In this case, we're looking at the envelope, pole, and gag proteins. Um, those are three major proteins that we look at just in general for uh, adaptive immune responses. And uh, each of these small chunks of the protein are about, you know, 10, well, like eight to 15 um, amino acids long. So they're very small and they go throughout the whole protein. And that's why, for instance, with the breadth, you know, the positive sub pools indicates the number of small um, epitope, the, their ep their, we call them epitopes, but it's the epitopes that are recognized by the cellular immune responses. So, you know, the breadth here on the right, positive sub pools means how many bits of the protein we're actually recognizing. For the magnitude, I, I feel like that's a bit more uh, intuitive. This is how strong the responses are. And um, the SFC means spot forming cells. So it's basically you actually count little blue dots on um, in this little well, and that tells you how many cells are actually causing an immune response um, at, or having an immune response to whatever peptide you're looking at. And, you know, higher is better. It's, it's, it's pretty, I feel like that part at least is very intuitive. And the reason we look at interferon gamma in particular is because uh, it's something that killer T cells tend to um, secrete uh, in order to cause uh, viral, uh, antiviral immune responses. So it's just basically do some of these cells recognize that there's something bad here and this specific bad thing. And uh, respond accordingly. So that's that's sort of something that's looked at for vaccine regimens and the like. So um, here, this is really the really important slide. It's showing that the triple treatment worked. Um, you know, this is just again viral loads, like I explained at the beginning. Um, and you know, the triple treatment group had seven out of ten animals virologically controlling by the end. That's great news. <laughs> It was wonderful. But again, these are animals that were treated at day nine post-infection. So, you know, we're stacking the deck a little, but it's a way for us to actually show that this might have potential. And it's something we'd want to look at maybe later in actual people instead of just monkeys. And then here, this is just sort of, it's a different way to show what we, what I showed in the last graph, um, I mean, in the last set of graphs that the triple treatment caused the lowest viral load um, loads just in general post art interruption and that the fewest of the monkeys ended up having the virus come back at all. So again, you have the survival curve on the right um, showing that if the animals were treated with the antibody and vesitolamod that, you know, they, not all of the animals rebounded to the end of, at the, by the end of the study. And on the left, this is just looking again at the viral loads at the end of the study, that's the set point viral load. And, um, you know, that basically, if you just look at all the animals, what's going on at the end of the study, the triple treatment group had the lowest number of animals that had um, positive viral loads and that the median uh, set point viral load was about equal for the other two uh, treatment groups. And that all of them were significantly better than the sham. And then finally, this, this is a slide that's sort of just reassuring everyone that 
the better the immune responses are, um, the more likely it is for the post art viral loads to be lower, sort of hammering home the fact that if you have an adaptive, a memory immune response that um, you're likely to have a lower, or I mean, I'm saying you, but in this case, it's actually the monkeys, but in general, this holds true for people as well. Um, that you're, if the better your immune response, you, you tend to have a, a slightly lower viral load in people. But in this particular study with the animals, it's very clear. Um, and I know that the R being less than 0.5 is a little funky looking, but what's important here are the P values. Um, so typically for anything significant, for any sort of um, scientific uh you know, significance factor 0.05 is the barrier. So that's one in, uh, it's a one in 20 chance of happening, of something happening just by chance. And typically when you have a, a animal study, you, you like this sort of p-value is very good. Um, so as if it's lower than like 0.01, that's great typically for whatever you're looking at. So, um, in conclusion, just to reiterate, you'll have a conclusion slide. Um, and using the vaccine, uh, the broadly neutralizing antibody and the immune activator together all prevented the virus coming back in these animals um, when they were taken off art. And it was roughly better than just combining the two together. So, and that's specifically what uh, passive and active immunization are. For the record, the passive immunization is when you actually give someone, say, an antibody to um, control uh, viral loads, which is something that's actually ongoing in, in clinical trials, and active immunization is vaccination. So that's sort of it for everything. Sorry, I went a little over explaining. No, no, no. But, I think that was fantastic. And so yeah. there, there are, I know we're at the, we're almost close to the top of the hour, but I just want to summarize some of the really key points that you mentioned in the beginning and kind of throughout, which is yeah. one, looking at this ad 26 MVA, that's this active immunization. And I know that we're going to see a few of these, not these particular vectors, but this idea of active immunization at CROI. So um, looking over that curved plot, right? Just making sure that you see those gag pole, um, that those are kind of standard things that people may test for, for immune responses. So we wanna mm -hmm. see those go up high and we wanna see a broad breath, right? So that shows us yeah. that the immune system is working. Mm -hmm. What I heard is that it's targeting the specific pathogen, in this case, yeah. HIV, right? In these, yeah. these studies. And then the immunization, the uh, passive, we want to see with the BNAPs that things go down. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were two questions that I just thought if you could quickly answer, mm -hmm. that would be really helpful is number one, thinking about animal studies, how do people relate that to humans? And just making sure, right. are those key questions enough? Is there something else that people should be looking for when they right. see animal studies? Okay, so, you know, with, as is the case with with all sorts of animal models, it's it's not people. It's whatever we test in the animals isn't necessarily actually going to translate to people. However, you know when you're looking at animal studies, something that seems to work very well or is looked at by multiple different laboratories, you know the the more you see it, the more likely it is that it's it's probably going to have some sort of effect. And really, when you get a very definitive result, like in, in, in an animal model, that's when people start to make the decision whether or not to actually continue to look at it in, say, a human clinical trial. So for instance, um, PGT-121, as an example, you know, was shown in a monkey model to really well uh, suppress um, suppress viral loads transiently with a uh, simian uh, human immunodeficiency virus, so a SHIV. And currently, um, and because of that, you know, it's a virus dependent thing that was figured to actually translate fairly well to humans. And a clinical trial actually just wrapped up using 
PGT-121 and two other broadly neutralizing antibodies as a uh, way to suppress viral loads to be undetectable in individuals who were previously up until that point treated with ARC. So it's it's complicated, but you know what what we try to do with animal models is to tease out why and how things happen, and keeping in mind the limitations of, for instance, the fact that a monkey is not a human. <laughs> um, you know, we we kind of make we have to make judgment calls based on the strength of the data whether or not to attempt something in people. So great. Yeah, I, if, I hope that answers the question. No, it does. And I think looking at that p-value, like you said, at the end is going to be really helpful. Yeah. I know we're at the top of the hour and I see Jim. And so I'm going to ask if actually what you what we can do is just the add 26 MVA vectors. People are just wondering if you could explain what that is um, okay. very, very quickly. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I can do that. I can do that very easily. Okay. So add 26 is adenovirus 26. Um, if you, so you guys have all probably heard of the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. Um, it's the same uh, general idea, just instead of sticking the COVID uh, spike protein, which is on the surface of the virus, into the AD26 for the AD26 to express. It's, 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 it just, it, it's sort of a safer way of doing that sort of vaccination. Um, we put the HIV proteins into the at 26 vector and it does the same thing. So it's just as safe and, um, you know, it's just a way to elicit an immune response without actually putting something very uh, dangerous in. And it, yeah, yeah. And with uh, MVA, modified vaccine Ankara, it's the same principle. It's just a different virus. And this virus specifically is a, um, is actually the uh, well, it's the smallpox vaccine, but uh, it's it's a more attenuated version, so it's less dangerous, and it's what's and without you know the HIV parts that we put in for this particular vaccine that we're using here, um, it's actually what's used as the monkeypox vaccine these days. So they're they're just you know viruses that we use and modify in order to produce um, produce viral particle um, viral bits um, for the immune system to recognize from uh, pathogens, from diseases that are, are too dangerous to like make, you know, a killed vaccine for, or, you know, a live attenuated vaccine and for which, you know, like just proteins wouldn't necessarily work. So that's that. great. <laughs> Sorry, I went no, over thank, No, no, that's, that's really helpful. I think it's, there are two viruses that when you put things inside them, they help show you the, the, the body, the bad stuff that yeah. you can recognize and form a response. That's super helpful. Yeah. Um, and Victoria, I just want to thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise and helping us walk through this slides and getting us ready for these Croy presentations. And I'm going to hand it back to Jim. It was my pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Victoria and Jessica. And I, a special thanks to Jessica for bringing this idea to us. We've been doing these pre Croy webinars for years. Um, and have kind of followed the same format year after year. And this year we mixed it up in a number of ways, bringing on folks from Croy to uh, specifically talk from their vantage point about the conference. Those things are new. Um, and then this whole section on um, upping our research literacy is new. And I think it's fantastic. It's gotten a lot of good feedback already. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for um, uh, joining us in that experiment. Uh, I think we'll bring it back again and again and again. And as Mitchell Warren said in the uh, the chat, this may be something we can bring forward in some of our webinars that we do um, and take some time to to bring those um, that kind of uh, engagement into some of our webinars that we do uh, throughout the year during Croy and after Croy. Um, those sorts of skills that we're picking up and understandings we are picking up will help us through everything that we're doing. So without further ado, I'm going to say uh, again, thank you to all the speakers who joined us. We had a lot of people who, who logged in and said hello. Thank you to the 163 people who registered and about the 70 people who came in real time. Thank you, thank you. Um, stay tuned, you'll get a, a follow-up email soon um, with a link to the slides. 
and, and to the recording. Um, everyone registered will get that. And also stay tuned for the Margarita Breakfast Club agenda and schedule. Um, they will be happening. You can be count on it every, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week from 7 to 8 a.m. Pacific time. We will have specific links for registering for those, um, specific Zoom links, and we'll have the content and speakers all sorted out in the next couple of days. And we'll be circulating that to everyone registered here on the Choice Agenda listserv and elsewhere. And you feel free to share the Margarita Breakfast Club information with anyone you'd like. Again, the Margarita Breakfast Clubs are happening during CROI, featuring some CROI information, but you do not need to be registered to CROI to access these. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I hope to see many of you in person in Seattle soon. I hope to see even more of you online, on Zoom. And also finally, before I say the final goodbye, um, we will be doing at least one follow-up webinar from CROI. So <clears throat> sometime in March, when some of the dust has settled and our heads are put back together, we will have at least one debrief webinar uh, to cover some of the stuff that we all heard at CROI and start to make sense of it uh, from a community perspective, from a policy perspective, what we do with this information. So stay tuned for that. We don't have a date. It'll be after CROI sometime in March-ish. Um, so watch this space. And to all of you, have a wonderful day. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's a good morning, afternoon, evening for you. And uh, we'll see you all uh, real soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.